Yo, 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 guys, welcome back to the Modern Creative Podcast episode. I believe it's 34 or 33, I always forget. But today I'm joined with the homie Juan Morales. He is a cinematographer based out of Toronto, Canada. Um, and he is also a really cool content creator for the NHL. And so, Juan, man, uh, appreciate you uh, joining uh, on the podcast, man. Thanks, man. I appreciate you having me on here. I've obviously been a fan of your show and watch you watch you when you were on your other podcasts and you're a, you're a dope creative. So as someone who also does podcasts, happy to happy to be on here to talk, you know, talk shop for a bit. Appreciate that, man. Uh, yeah, dude, I, I remember when I first saw your work. Uh, it's crazy seeing your growth a few years ago. I think the first, I think you were shooting like either local high school basketball or something like that. And then seeing to like seeing how far you've gone since I've seen that piece of specific piece of content is like the growth that you've been, it has been insane, man. Especially with all the content creation you're posting as far as, far as like personal stuff, uh, filming for the NF, uh, NHL, uh, should I say? And, uh, man, it's just like super props for your growth and like your consistent work, man. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. It's been, uh, it's it, like, I, I literally had this conversation a few days ago with my girlfriend. I was like, I can't believe in, I've been doing this for like you know, four or five years. And I realized like, oh, I'm going on year six of doing this. Like, so like the growth is like obviously shown that way, but it, it seems overnight, but like six years is a lot of time to like really go through things. But like, it is crazy. Like, like you were saying, like we go from one year shooting my university team here. And then the next time shooting the NHL, it's, it's been a crazy ride, but I'm obviously incredibly grateful and like super happy to be doing what I'm doing. And I think you could relate to this and anyone listening to this who works in this field, like you love what you do, right? So you just want to keep going and, and seeing that growth progress. So, so yeah, that's kind of been the gist of my journey so far. That's awesome, man. Uh, so Juan, so, so let's, let's take it back, man. So when you first picked up the camera, have you always been a creative from the jump or is this something that that kind of sparked late, later in life? So let's let's talk about all that, man. Yeah, I mean, it definitely, I think it sparked later in life. I mean, I'm, I'm still pretty, I, I just turned 26 a few weeks ago. So, uh, but it, you know, holding a camera isn't something like being a cinematographer or content creator wasn't something that I, I think I wanted to do when I was a kid. Um, but I remember kind of like the pivotal point for me was going into university or, you know, you, you guys in the USA college, but same thing going into university. I knew I wanted to work in sports somehow. I've always played sports, watched sports, soccer, hockey, rugby, like played it as a kid, you know, loved it. Um, and I think everyone as a kid has that moment where like, oh, I'm not going to go pro. I'm not going to go play in the NBA or go play, you know, pro hockey or whatever. Um, so I kind of realized like, I want to still work in sports. And there was like a moment where I was about to go to another school for kinesiology, but I applied to a sport media program here in Toronto at TMU. And it was like a really small program, brand new, like 60 people get in. And I, I just, I just applied. And at the time, the only creative work I had was like, I wrote for a hockey website, like a blog, um, Oh, so, so you, you've always been a fan of hockey since the jump. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I've been like, so I was, so I was raised, so I was born in Columbia. I'm like, like straight out of Columbia, but I was raised in Canada, just outside of Toronto. So I grew up in around soccer, but then ended up finding hockey through school and friends. So I've always been a fan of it. So, you know what I mean? Like I wrote, I wrote, I wrote on a blog about hockey. I wanted to work in it at some point. So, uh, that was like, I either kind of made the choice of like, Hey, either I'm going to go into kinesiology and help the athletes or go into the sport media thing and tell stories, which at the time I knew I liked doing because I liked writing, but I've never picked up a camera before. Like I played around with GoPros and like a little point and shoot, like everyone, everyone has. Right. Um, and then, you know, going into that program, I was still kind of figuring out what I wanted to do. Like I, you know, I, there was writing classes, there was classes on digital media, like, you know, video editing. And it was something that intrigued me, but I didn't think I'd really like. And then there was one project, I think it would have been in my second year second year or my first semester my first year second semester where we had to create like a little short documentary on on a, on an athlete from the school and i did it like all by myself i don't remember why i know i had a group but i ended up just like saying like you know what i'm just gonna do this uh i got like a t3i out of like the cage we booked we rented a t3i out and like i just created this little short documentary and it was like so much fun for me to tell that story and you know, I don't know how you're in San Diego, you're down south. So I don't know how prevalent hockey is down there. But like growing up here in Canada, like during games, you'd see all these little short documentaries and short features of the players in the intermissions or like ahead of a game. And I always loved those. You know what I mean? Like that, like little short documentaries like that were like the pinnacle of storytelling for me when I was growing up. So I said, I want to do something that I would see on TV one day, like emulate it. And I shot it with like a really like little camera and you know no idea what aperture was like zero idea what like you know iso or anything i just you know it looked good in the back of the camera so i just kept shooting it and i created this little documentary and 
you know, looking back at it now, it's trash. I look at it. I'm like, what the fuck was I doing? Um, but I actually like we have like our media school has like an awards at the end of the year, kind of like the Oscars for a program. And I ended up winning an award for it for a piece of work. I like, you know, just submit it because I said, like, why not? Right. So like that was like kind of like the start of it all. And then I just kind of like cued it, clued in. And I'm like, hey, I could make this a career like I could find something in this and like, you know, and it just kind of like snowballed from there, right? Like I got my, I got, you know, a, a better camera. I started shooting our athletic department, creating content for them. And then they just snowballed into where I am now. That's just kind of how it started, you know? Wow. Wow. So like, uh, man, that's, that's pretty cool. Cause I mean, I feel like most creatives have gone through a similar journey where it kind of starts for fun. Um, at least for me, it was like, it, it started with the GoPro for me and, uh, yeah. just, gradually like just getting into the editing process and enjoying the process of filming and shooting and getting to learn, getting to learn the aperture, the triangle exposure. I, I vividly remember with the GoPro days, like I'm like, dude, how come my cam my, my videos do not look like, like the yeah. Sam Colder videos or something like that. Cause they obviously had a DSLR or mirrorless camera back then. And I, I just had a little dinky GoPro with the one little lens. And so I'm like, I want to, I want, I want to, I want to blur my background just like those videos. And then learning that process, man, was such a fun, it was a fun ride. Uh, and uh, here we are now, man. So uh, everyone wants to know, man, for, for those that are listening right now, how did you get to work with the NHL? That's a, that's like, I, I always say to people, like, that is one question I get asked consistently. How'd you do it? And I'm like, do you want the long version? Or do you want the short version? I, I'll give you both. The short version is I just worked for, I like put, like put in work for, three or four years in university and just coming out of university to get here. Um, I think that there's kind of this misconception that you're just going to walk into something like it's, it's not like I worked. So like I told you, I worked in my school's athletic department. Like that was my whole thing. And I, I stress to people like you got to start somewhere, start in your local, like your community. Right. So I did that for a few years. I, I worked in the athletic department as a video producer. I shot content, whatever, whether it was like hype videos, features, stuff like that. And I just built up the body of work through there. And then I went on and I worked for like two or three years with MLSE, which is like uh, the company here that owns the Leafs, the Raptors, uh, TFC, the Argos, all our sports teams here in Toronto. I was an editor with them for like two or three years, learned so much, like had a ton of fun. I was with TSN, which is like our version of ESPN here. I was on their social team. I actually did graphic design for them. Oh, wow. So not even close to this. And I, I, you know, that was a completely different journey that I learned other things in, but it also just like reoriented me and telling me that I was doing this video thing. Right. But I did this for like, you know, for my second year of university, like truly my mom always says like, you didn't sit still from your second year of university until today. Like I have, I'm always doing something. Um, so I did that. I did that through second year, third year, my fourth year university. I worked like three different jobs, like three of those jobs that I just mentioned. And I was doing my thesis. And then I did a fifth year university just to graduate to get the paper. Jeez. And then I got out of university and it really like was I, I mean, going to my sec, my third year with the NHL. So it would have been two summers ago that I kind of, to be honest with you, I found it on Twitter. I, I just kind of was on Twitter and I had like three or four people DM me, like friends DM me this tweet that my now boss put up on Twitter. And they were like, you should apply to this. I go on it, I click on it, filled out the application. They were looking for a video editor, a video creative in Toronto uh, who worked in sports and like, you know, I fit the bill. So I applied, went through the whole process like everyone else did in that same thing. And I, and I got the job, but you know, that's me saying, I just found it on Twitter and I applied the job. The, the actual thing is that like this career path and this opportunity was the culmination of like six plus years of like hustling to get into the right place to like when the right opportunity came, I was ready. I had the portfolio. I was locked in and that's really how I got it. There was no, nothing else to it. It's just, it's so easy when people are like, Oh my God, how'd you get it? So simple. I just, <laughs> I just applied like everyone else, but like there was, there was background work the entire time I was doing it. Right. So, and during this background work, uh, you're working when you're in university as well. Like are, are these like internships or these are actually like paid, paid jobs? Um, some, most of them actually, so most of them were paid. Like, I, I think people misunderestimate. You can make money like at just starting off here. I actually, there was one other thing. I did do an unpaid internship with a hockey team. I don't really talk about it just because like it, I, I didn't really learn anything from it, but gotcha. all the other jobs when I was in my athletic department, I started off for free, but I ended up being like, you know, working part-time for them. So I was making like, you know, 15, 14 bucks an hour. Um, did I get paid for all those hours? No, because I was working like way more than I should have. But, you know, I was I mean, got part time there with MLSC. It was like a freelance part time gig. So I would get paid like a, an editor's rate for every project I work on. TSN was a part time job kind of vibe. So 
I would, you know, make an hourly wage. So that, that, you know, I was making money as I was doing this. I was very fortunate though. Like I know a lot of people who work in this sports creative side of things. Like you're making no money for a while. And, and that's just how it is. Right. Like, but you know, I, I definitely was very fortunate to make money as I was going. And now I have a full-time job with like benefits, uh, a salary that is, Comple- that is completely different world right like so it's, cool, it's like man. goes zero to 100 damn dude so like having benefits and all that's so amazing man i'm, I'm literally leeching off my wife's uh benefits right now so, <laughs> so i could say i am a creative with benefits so that's a good yeah, yeah, no, right that, there. that counts man that counts um and let's let's uh let's nerd out a little bit man let's talk about gear man so uh you like your youtube channel you talk a lot about um the sony systems and whatnot and you came from the 6300 background correct or 65 yeah a63 that was my first camera i just sold that thing like three weeks ago and it was like a very like oh you brought me here now i someone you're gonna give it to someone else you know what i mean so yeah i started out with that and i've been a sony guy ever since and and uh why sony over like canon or nikon or panasonic honestly i i couldn't remember us like now now it's because i have it's like everyone else you're in the ecosystem you have all the lenses you have everything that's compatible like I would have to sell everything. Yeah, once then, you're invested, you just cannot Once you're invested, change, yeah. like, that's the thing. It's not that easy to switch, like, uh, you know, switch bodies and switch companies. When I started, I just, I think I had a friend who had the A6300 and we used it for a shoot. And I was, like, renting cameras out from the cage and they were, like, T3Is or, like, whatever. They were nothing. And then I saw what that thing could do and I was like, dude, that looks awesome. Like, what cameras? I just bought it. Like, I yeah, saw that, that- it. I wanted it. I bought it. And I was hooked. Now that I've been doing this for a while, like there's a lot of reasons why I like Sony a little more than Canon. I'm not the kind of guy who's gonna shit on Canon or Lumix. Like I'll shit on Nikon a bit just because we all we all do it. Because <laughs> it's always fun to, to make fun of Nikon. <laughs> you, you just you just can't. But they're great cameras. But I'm just, but like for Sony, like the low light so good. And working in sports, like you're gonna be in some really shitty low light situations. That I use mostly the A7S III. This thing can see in the dark for all intents and purposes. Like it's amazing. The autofocus great like there's so many things that i like about this camera system and like sony cameras in general not there's no shade towards other it's just what i've been using and it's if it ain't broke don't fix it right seeing someone that that like someone like you that does like heavy video stuff i'm surprised you never like went for the fx3 or do you see yourself even upgrading to like an fx6 eventually somewhere down the line so i was funny because i i had the a6300 and i remember i had that for like three or four years and i was like waiting to see when i would upgrade and the a7 III came out and it was this like game changer everyone had one but like i didn't really see the growth between going from one to the other apart from it being full frame so i got the a7 as soon as the a7s3 was released like i i ordered that i got it like there's zero hesitation like at the time, it, this thing is like, it's crazy. I think I've had this for three years now. It's been, it's three years old. But at the time, no camera had 4K 120. No camera had 10 bit recording at a, like a, at a prosumer level. Right. No camera had these features. So I bought it. But then Sony pulled the rug under everyone and be like, hey, jokes, we have a cinema version of this. I had a few friends who switched over to the FX3, sold it and got, but at the end of the day, I'm just like, I'm going to sell this. I'm going to make not everything I got from it. Like, I'm just going to keep it. I love this thing. And I, I've used the FX3. It's a great camera, but for me, it's like it's the same sensor. Mm-hmm. It produces the same image. Could I use all the cinema features in that camera? Absolutely. Do I need them? I've been fine without them. Why would I need to switch it in? Um, I actually am looking at. I was literally looking right before this call at buying the FX30 as a second camera. Okay. I'm like tiptoeing the line. I'm like, ah, I could just rent it. I don't really need it. I don't shoot as much as I used to, so I don't really know if I can justify it. So I was like looking at that for B camera. I would love to have an FX6 in the future or something along those lines. The one thing is I shoot a lot in 120 frame slow motion. On the FX6, if you want to do that, you sacrifice audio. And for me, it's like if I'm shooting like the end of a football game in 120 frames, I'm just going to keep rolling. But with the A7S III, FX3, you can keep audio rolling. Audio will roll with the 120. With the FX6, it's gone. So like, I I had no idea. I didn't know that. I actually didn't know that. I just shot a podcast with another friend of mine, and I asked him, like, what's your dream camera? He's like, FX6, but this. And I did my own research. I'm like, oh, that seems, like, really shitty. I think the FX6 is so good for, like, everything. But, like, with any camera, like, there are limitations, right? Like, you know, whether or not it's a cinema camera or not, like, this, the A7S III, is what does the job for me. It's what has done it for me for three years now. 
why, and, you know, eventually I feel like there will be a camera that can do that in a cinema line. But for now, like, I'm fine with this. It's getting the job done. It produces incredible images. I don't I don't feel pressure to upgrade. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, just some of the some of the images that you pull out of your camera, man, like just seeing your Instagram and seeing your YouTube channels, like, bro, like, it, it's hard to believe that came from a, a mirrorless camera. Like, you think it's like a cinema camera easy. Yeah, no, it's, I think, I think cameras, I mean, Sony keeps dropping cameras like every freaking week, like, but everyone gets better and everyone kind of pushes like, they're doing the Apple thing where they like give you that, you know, you have a couple, couple, couple of features here and there. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, but then you know it? how Apple like re releases like five iPads and one gets you a little bit closer to the best one. You're like, oh, maybe I should just pay the extra five hundred dollars. They're kind of doing that now. So but at the same time, like cameras, like I think everyone knows that, like, I guess I, I would probably say the FX3 slash A7S3 is like kind of the go to right now for not just beginners, but people like I see other professional NHL teams use this system. I see, you know, we use it like it's such it it is. I remember when the F A7S II came out, that thing was like a game changer. Everyone yep. loved that thing, mm -hmm. like praised it to the moon. And they just took it and made it better with this. And I, I just don't again, I don't see a reason to upgrade like this thing produces. I, I got hate on my TikTok and my YouTube recently for calling this a cinema camera. But <laughs> trigger you, words. <laughs> I have I have a friend of mine who's a YouTuber, his name Kofi, he made a comparison between this, the FX3, the FX... You can... They're virtually identical images. Yeah. At the end of the day, like, a client isn't going to ask me what I shot it on. They're just going to see a, a really nice visual, and that's they don't, all. They don't give a damn. They don't... No one cares except for, like, us nerds. <laughs> yeah, and I, I literally say to people, I'm like, what would you think about this camera? I'm like, as long as you get the shot and it looks good, like, no... You will be the only one who cares. You know yep. what I mean? And, like, this thing produces such a beautiful image, dynamic range, up the wazi. I love this thing. I could talk its praises forever. It's the best camera I've ever owned. Um, so I really don't see a reason why, why to upgrade at the moment. Right. To totally makes sense. I'm, I'm, I'm totally there with you, man. Let's talk about a little bit of lenses. Uh, what kind of lenses do you have right now? Yeah, I got, uh, I got, I had quite, I had a few, but I've kind of grown the collection, especially in recent months. So my go-to usually is the Tamron 28 to 75, um, really affordable lens, really good lens. I could, you know, get a G master, but again, it gets, gets the job done. I have had a lot of com discussions in my comments with, Oh, you should get a G master. Like you'll be a professional. I'm like, no, I be a professional two, get a G Master is I, insane. I've shot, I've shot two Stanley Cup finals with this thing and has pulled out beautiful images. Like I don't need to. So the Tamron twenty to seventy five is like my go to, like every day, like whatever I'm doing lens. I have a seventy to two hundred G Master, the F four. That's great for sports, any general sports shooting. Um, that's usually my go to for something like football or even like you know soccer, something where you're a bit further away. I I'm like looking around my room, around my room to look at my lenses. I have a sixteen to thirty five GM that I got a little bit over about half a year ago. I love this thing for YouTube. I love this thing for scenics or like just general, like day to day video. Like I just took this on vacation with my girlfriend and that was the only lens I used just to like capture moments, right? Like it's such a versatile lens. I never owned one before this one um, and I absolutely love it. I also have a 55 prime a Zeiss lens and then a 35 uh, G master prime, which I just bought. Um, those two are great. Like low light lenses, the 1.4 35 is like, whoa like this thing is like shoots beautiful photos amazing video the depth of field is out of this world i usually use those more for like documentaries like sit down interviews and stuff or like if i really want that low light um but those are the lenses that i use right now just a pretty small collection they all have a purpose like that's my thing i don't like owning a bunch of gear just to own it which is why i'm like really debating do i need an fx30 or is it just gonna sit on my shelf like my a6300 did for almost two years so i i like having gear that i know i'm going to be using on a consistent basis versus just gathering dust right i love that i love that man um and as far as like uh tell me a little bit how you approach like an nhl game like you're not using every single i can't imagine you using every single lens right no no um i usually only really stick with two like uh, it, it really depends on the situation. Uh, I, I truly think you can just shoot a hockey game on a 24 to 70 equivalent lens, like my 20 to 75. Um, it's very different from other sports where, I mean, it's similar to basketball in terms of the distance you have with the players because you can be right up against the boards and the field, the, the field of play that like the rink isn't as big as a football field. So I feel like most of the times I get away with just shooting it on the 24 to 70. It just really depends on to where I am on the rink. When I'm shooting a game, there's a, not many camera spots in major events. I'm, I mostly shoot the final, any outdoor games, like the big marquee events. So there's a lot of cameras and not a lot of camera holes. So a lot of people are just around the glass or in the 300s. 
uh, it'll be the 20 to 75 if I'm ever around the glass or say the team I'm mostly trying to cover is on the other side, I'll then pull the 70 to 200. But the problem with the 70 to 200 is when the puck comes back into your zone, 70 isn't wide enough to capture what's going on, whether it's like a battle in the corner or a goalie making a save, you're really tight in. So that's why generally I'll just stick with the 20 to 75. And if I have to shoot the other end, like, so be it, it'll be a little wider, but you know, you don't, I don't want to miss something. If I'm in the corner, I don't want to miss something right in front of me because I'm at 70. I'd rather be at 28 or 35 or whatever. The 70 to 200 will come out if I'm in like the 200s. If I go up into the bowl, like shooting downwards, that's when the 70 to 200 is really good because you can get really close up onto the ice. Even at that distance, like you can fill the frame up with a player decently well, not like details, but you can get them and you can track them really well. So that's why I would bring that. It's great for that kind of stuff. I haven't really used the 16 to 35 or the any of the primes just because I haven't had the need to. I've used the 16 to 35 to capture like scenics and fan stuff at the start of the game. That's always great for that. But and like I've used it on the bench a little bit. It's great for photos. It's really good. I've used it on the bench for warmups and like I'll just shoot that thing and it looks great. You see the whole arena super wide and like, you know, I use it for that stuff, but not really haven't really used that um, 16 to 35 much or the primes much. However, I did shoot a basketball game recently and I shot a whole quarter using 35 and I was pleasantly surprised. So maybe there's something in the future where I would do it. But for now, it's like the 28 to 75 and the 7200 are like the I won't leave home without lenses for this kind of stuff. That's awesome. And so how do you really approach like like when you go to like these games, like are, are you like do you have specific deliverables that you need to turn in for the NHL or do you have kind of just like freestyle it and let's see what I could cook up in, in the editing po in the editing uh, part of the game? Uh, it really depends. I think every event's different. Uh, for the most part, like I'm turning around stuff as we go. Um, so if I'm shooting a game and someone scores a goal, I'm like, literally, my process is so convoluted and unnecessary, but I do it because it makes sense for me. I shoot everything in log. And, you know, the other people shooting the game for us are usually, apart from like our big cameras, are people we call LSCs or, you know, the NFL and MLB use the word LCC, just content creators we hire to shoot the games and capture moments for us. They usually don't shoot things in log, so they pull, you know, they have like the little dongle, they pull the clipper into the phone and send it off to us because we have to turn stuff over. Basically, the concept is like we shoot it, we capture it, it goes right into so to our social team and they post it immediately. So that's why yeah. how you see clips from DSLR cameras go up like, you know, you within might within seconds, might, <laughs> within seconds, right? Like that's how it is. And when you're not shooting on phone. So for me, same diff, but I shoot everything in log just because I love to color grade and mess around with it later. I kind of just put myself in a tough situation. I will literally have my camera bag with me with my laptop in it. And like so many times I've been in an arena, they've scored a goal. I back onto the concourse, find like a flat service, pull my laptop up, put the card in, put the clip in the color grades already there. Cause I've made it before the game export send it off go back to the same thing like that's Jeez. literally my thought. so i like within seconds you know you miss up you miss things like i was shooting game five of the stanley cup final and i missed like three goals in five minutes because i was uploading one clip but you got to get it up right but like that's the thing like i could also shoot in like i could shoot in in a normal mode but i know for the projects down the line i'm trying to do and that my bosses want to have having that flexibility in post with log is clutch a lot of the other footage we got from our creators are great, but we can't really grade it to the same degree as much as we want other things. So it's kind of like I'm the balancing act because I my main job with the NHL is like an editor slash producer kind of vibe. So I'm also I'm not just turning stuff over in game, but like post game, I have, you know, a certain project or something I'm trying to deliver on or something ahead of the game. So like after the Stanley Cup final this year, shot everything, got on the ice, got the footage, whatever. Went back to my hotel room and all night I was editing a piece to go up the next morning. So Jeez, it's man. stuff during the game. It's stuff after the game. It's stuff leading up to the game. So winter classics and the, all the outdoor games, I'll be there shooting practices, scenics for the two or three days before throwing a video together. And then that goes up the day of the game. So like stuff like that, it really it's different things every time that I'm kind of producing and it'll never be the same thing, which is kind of nice, you know? Dude, with like with that process that you just described right now, plus like all the traveling that you've done in the last year or two that I've seen, oh man, it's like, bro, like my air how miles do you, are up. How do you not go through any kind of burnout? Oh, you do. That's, I think that is the number one thing I've noticed when I've, when I started working full time in the NHL, because a lot of the people in the creative space that I know, a lot of my friends, not just sports people, are freelancers. You make your own schedule. You know that yourself. You make your own schedule. You can say yes or no to shoots. You can do this and that, whatever. You're kind of your own boss. So you can take 
a lot of time, more time off. I haven't taken a vacation, a proper vacation in three years because I've been working so much and I have to earn vacation time like any other full time job. The burnout is real. And I learned that I definitely felt it last year because the first year I worked at the NHL, I came in halfway through the season. I came in like December. And then the second year I did. I just finished my first full, you know, October to June whole season, whole season grind. And, you know, I love having the ability to travel to events that I've kind of built the built trust and confidence in them for me, for them to bring me on. But it's so exhausting after going to a, a brand new city for a week, you know, you shoot and then you have to take another flight back. Like the travel is such a cool experience. You get to visit new places, see new, see new cities, meet new people, but you are so exhausted because it's like four or five days of like, we need to get everything done. And then you have the game. And then once that high wears off, you're dead. So it's like the burnout is truly exhausting. And the Stanley Cup final is like a very perfect example of how the life that you see everyone post who works in pro sports isn't always like it's glamorous. You see the highlights. What you don't see, you see, you know, I'll post goals. I'll post them lifting the cup. You'll post like, you know, cute little moments of the family. You get to share the cool stuff. What people don't see is that like you're traveling almost every other day, getting on a plane for four or five hours, going east to west because the final is between the east and the west. So to give you an idea of the te- the travel this year, it was a little bit different. But last year it was like the first four games we spend. You, you get to you get to the first city. You're there for a day or two. Game one, you have a day off. Game two. And then after game two, you're going to the other city. And that's the same thing. You have two days, game two. But once again, but even then, that's like, you know, two flights, three flights within the span of a week and a bit. And then when you get to games five, six, and seven, it's game, travel, game, travel, Jeez. game. So it's like you are, I, I, I take like seven flights in the span of two weeks. And it really depends on where the cities are. But like these last few years, it was Tampa and Colorado, which is like a four hour flight each way. And then this year it was Florida and Vegas. And those two cities, believe it or not, are really difficult to travel between two. So I would fly from like, I ended up missing a few games to the final because I was at the combine. But even then I'm traveling like I would have, I, I did like Buffalo, Minnesota, Vegas. And if they didn't win in game five, I would have had to go Vegas and then I think Denver and then Florida. And then if they Jeez. didn't win that, I would to go. So like it's it's exhausting. See, it's, and I'm assuming you're just doing direct flights like this whole time. No, <laughs> like it's not always city, direct flights. Vegas and Miami surprisingly don't or Fort Lauderdale or whatever don't have direct flights. There are some cities where you you literally have to do a connection. Sometimes you get lucky and you can do a direct. But like most of the time, like even when I came back to Toronto, I had to fly from Vegas to LAX from LAX to Toronto. So it added an extra hour on the flight and like after all that you come home and you still got to be in the office on Monday or whenever the hell it is. Right. And, and this year and last year, I really, really felt it. And like, I literally like my, when I told my boss, I'm taking a vacation. It's like, good. You're like, you, you really need that, you know? So it's like the burnout is, is incredibly true, especially when you're doing this full time, you know, I don't get to say to my boss, I think I'm not going to come to the office today. You know, right. like, I have to, I have, and the, the other exhausting thing is you have to keep being creative. You have to come up with content during the season, almost every single day, come with an idea, edit it, take two or three days, post it. Okay. What's the next thing? Like, that's the other thing, like be doing it full time. Like you were, ex- you were expected to consistently make stuff. And that's not a bad thing. That's the job I hired up for. You were feeding the content machine. Yeah, um, the content machine is really intense. Like, especially I feel like the like the more the more we do this, it's like it's only getting more. They want things faster done. Like, I need this now, 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 now. Kind of like when you're already shooting something, you, you you capture a goal. You have to go and edit it, turn it in, and I see it in social media within thirty minutes. It's like, bro, like how do they do that? Like, I, I assume from the outside in that it's like a team of like five or six in that specific specific crew right there. But I mean, you mentioned it, it's like you're by yourself, so it's a lot. It's a lot of work for one man to do. Yeah. And, and like, don't get me wrong. We have, thank God we have other people posting. I like, I'm, I'm doing my job doing video, occasionally photos. We have a whole social team whose job is to post, but even their job, like you're doing this every single night. Like sports is, I, I, I had a conversation on my own podcast with a friend of mine and I, and my former mentor. And he says, if you love that, if you want to work in this, in this, you have to fucking love it. Like you sports are a thing where like, It'll chew you up and spit you right back out if you aren't if you don't want it. It'll it, it it it's a machine of its own. It knows when you don't want to be there. It knows when you know 
and the people there, like the people who have been there forever, like are some of the hardest working people I've ever met. Like they're grinding because it's just, it's the entertainment industry. It's part of it, right? It's, it's just gonna, it's really, you have to love it in order to really get through it. Sometimes the burnout sucks and I'll take a day off because I feel it. But like, you know, at the end of the day, like the burnout isn't turning me off from doing this. I'm going to keep pushing because I love doing it. Do you, do you see yourself, uh, sticking with the NHL for the next like five years or so, or do you see yourself evolving and maybe doing some sort of like sports stuff? I can see you doing a sports documentary, man. Like, like I can see those, like the ones that you've seen like on Netflix or an HBO, like I can see you actually doing that and pulling that off. I love sports docs. Like I, I, it's what's, uh, you know, documentaries have always been something I've been interested in, not even sports wise. My dad and I just would always watch them all the time, no matter what it was. So I've always had a really deep appreciation for documentary storytelling. Um, right now the NHLs, I love it. It's been a place where I've been able to do things I would have never freaking imagined in my life. Shooting the same, like a final meeting, all these athletes, like flying to different cities. And I'm not like at any point soon think I'm ready to hang that, hang them, hang up my skates yet in that sense. Right. Like I love doing it, but you know, I documentaries are something I definitely want to do more of. I've been meaning to, and I've been telling myself for over a year now to like prep and shoot a documentary, but it's hard when you have a full-time job. Oh, yeah. It's hard to find the time to do it. Um, you know, I think that's something, you know, scheduling wise, I'll end up working on my own and trying to, you know, the thing about having a full-time job is that having that consistent income has allowed me to do so many different things with my life. And that's in sense of like, I can live, I'm living in downtown Toronto now. I can have my own life. I just paid for a vacation for myself. Like, as an adult, like, you know what I mean? Like crazy. Right. But like, it's because I have this job that I love and it pays the bills and I'm really thankful for that. So I think my whole thing is like, I'm going to stick with it, see where I can go because, you know, I feel like it's an area where I can grow and I want to be a creative director one day, whether that's here, whether it's somewhere else and do things along the side. Like I still do freelance on the side. I, I would love to do a bit of a documentary piece down the line on an athlete, on a team, you know, wherever I've been able to work with a lot of athletes in the Toronto area and, and, you know, do other things like that. So for now, like I could say I'll be here for the next three years. I could be here for the next five years. I don't know, but, um, I, I love it right now. It's providing me everything I've ever wanted in my career. And if other things come down the line, you know, that just depends on what it is, right? Like I've always taken the content creation game, especially in sports. It is like everything happens for a reason. And it's like a wave. Sometimes you're going to be on the ups. Sometimes you're going to be on the downs. I've had some really low moments in my career and you just got to wait them out and wait for the next thing to, for the next door to open. And like every time I've kind of felt that going on the going on that down down curve, like whether it's now or later, like I feel like everything does happen for a reason. There's been that natural progression in my career that shows me that like I may be here for another two years, but then something might come up and something might happen. You never know. Right. 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 Now you just get to keep riding that wave for right now, man. One of the things I appreciate about your uh, YouTube channel is that you really focus down on your specific niche, which is specifically sports videography, which is for the most part, I feel like most creators create content for just a whole general landscape of how to get certain clients, how to get clients in general, how to make money and all that good stuff and talk about gear. But you really deep down on the actual sports videography, which I feel I find that quite unique, man. Tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah, I mean, the YouTube channel just kind of came because of COVID to give you some background, like everyone was locked just inside. And I decided, you know what, I've always watched YouTube. I've always consumed it growing up. Like, why don't I just make a YouTube video like channel and start talking about my experiences? And like, I, I grappled a lot at the start of like my creative filmmaking career, uh, kind of along the lines of like whether or not I should niche down and just work in sports or do everything. And I, I've done other things. I've done you know, some, you know, commercial work, I've done some narrative work, I've done the corporate stuff. And it's fun, but it just doesn't like, do it for me as much as sports does. Like, so I, I and the thing is, there's so many other YouTube channels talking about filmmaking and content creation in general, and there's nothing wrong. I have a lot of friends who do it. I learned from so many people I learned from those people, you know what I mean? But I was like, how do I differentiate myself? from everyone else doing the same thing, talking about the same cameras, talking about how to shoot an interview or, or, or whatever, because I want I want you to come to me because I'm offering you something that other people can't. And I'm very happy to say that, like, I think I've accomplished that. Like my whole thing is like, if you want to work in sports, I want to help you. I want to teach you. I want to tell you my experiences because Again, I'm not knocking anybody who makes YouTube videos about cameras. I think those people are so helpful. Like they, I was watching, I was watching them right before this call, figuring out whether to get the FX30. But for me, it's just like I want to 
tell you what I know about this camera from my actual experience using this camera at a high level event. Anybody can make a Sony a7S III review. Not many people can make a how the Sony a7S III worked for me during the Stanley Cup final video. Like, not That's many a bar. people can do that. That's a stunt too, man. <laughs> right? You, I'm not, but it's not a stunt. It's like, I, I'm proving that you can use these cameras in like the highest scenario, right? So like my whole thing is like, I want you, I want to, I, I'm, I like to think I can back up whatever I say because of my experiences. You know what I mean? Anyone can say they use this camera, but I've used it at this level of doing these things. So I think that's like kind of how I realized I wanted to do it. I wanted to not just share about the gear and my editing techniques, but I want to talk about my experiences and I want to talk about how you can get a job, how you can network. Like I have a whole series of videos. I just posted one a while ago, like, but I'm coming with more videos, like how you can actually get a job in sports, how you can look for them, how you can like find them, what you can do to prepare yourself, you know, I think talking about experiences is something that's really missed out in the YouTube space. Like people, again, talk about gear, talk about this, that, but like no one ever actually talks about like what it takes to find these connections or what it takes to build your network or what it takes to, you know, when you get to this event, what do you, what should you do? What should you not do? Right. So I'm really happy that I'm able to provide that. And there's not many people in the sports creative world doing this thing. I think there are like two or three other guys who I know personally who are awesome. And it's kind of cool because like, we're not competing against each other. Like my friend Peter Sorellis is a pretty well-known YouTuber in the sports space now. More subs than me. He's been grinding way more than me. Um, and like me and him are good buddies. Like it's not a competition. I feel like amongst YouTubers, sometimes there's a competition, like trying to build each other, like build above each other. Like everyone I've talked to in this space doing that or TikTok has been so good. And I, I, I really also appreciate that from the very few people that I've met doing what I do. But that's the thing. Like I, I wanted to niche down because I knew there's a specific audience who wanted this kind of stuff. You know, you can learn from someone who has shot a commercial before, but how is that going to help you when you want to shoot the Super Bowl? I've shot a major league sporting event final. I can tell you what it's like and what you should prepare for. I can tell you about the burnout. I can tell you about like that actual experience that not other people can. So I think that's like one, like I love teaching people and I love sharing my experiences so people can learn from them. And like I, people say this all the time. I wanted to be the guy that I couldn't find on YouTube when I started. I wanted to be, you couldn't back when I started four or five years ago, there was no one doing this YouTube thing. My, like, you know what I mean? So I wanted to be the guy that I would have gone to for advice in working in the sports field, you know? I feel you, man. I actually really enjoy your actual uh, channel because I was going to get into a couple of sports video stuff in the past and uh, I was debating on getting it. I knew I wanted a 7200 lens, but I wasn't sure if I wanted to get the G Master lens 2.8 or just the F4 version. And your video literally inspired me to get the F4 version over the 2.8 uh -huh. because like the, about the the weight, the cost and all that good stuff. It's like you, the, the 2.8 versus F4 is like it's really hard to tell when you're such a tight focal length anyways and yeah. so that sold me to like all right let me see let me save myself a couple uh, thousand dollars or if not more on but the that F4 comes version. from the experiences too right like i'm i'm not just saying that because you know i feel like anybody gone anyone can go make a video and say this is why you should get the 2.8 but practically it might not make sense for you like we just talked about the fxx at the start of this i could go on and i could watch a dozen youtube videos as to why the fxx is the best camera for me practically it doesn't make sense but i've only learned that through my real world experiences which is like the whole thing i'm trying to share you know what i mean like right, right. i'm well, i'm talking the talk because i've learned this by walking the walk mm -hmm. yeah and this isn't a, a knock to like the youtubers because i i mean there's a lot of them that you, we could probably relate to like we i watch these youtubers all the time like when it comes to gear and stuff like that how to shoot interviews etc cetera, etc cetera. but one thing i i appreciate youtubers such as yourself and others that they say what they experience and they actually show like BTS work or the actual footage of themselves or footage of the actual work that you guys did to show like, all right, this is why I did this because of the end result right here, where someone could literally just turn on the camera and just say, you should get the 7200 2.8 because it's just the best lens out there right now. Like I want to, I want to know why, like, I want to see some images. I want to see like what produced, like why this, this lens is better than this lens because of the images that you've produced in the past, besides just telling me like, well, it's the best. It's a G Master. That's why you should get it. Like to me, it's not good enough. Uh, <laughs> I like to but see. I, like, I think that's what you see on all the higher level YouTubers in the film space. Ex exactly. Not, not, not myself, even like other people who are doing amazing work with these cameras, but they're actually showing how they use it because, you know, I think there are some people like, and, and I'm not knocking that. Gerald Undone is such a smart guy. 
He's like a wizard. Like, I, I don't understand half the things. My brain capacity for his videos is like minimal because he's just, but he's a great guy if you don't want to know the ins and outs of a camera. Yeah, but if you really want to get nerdy with it. <laughs> but and, but that, that, that has a purpose in it. Some people really love that stuff. And, but for me, I don't want to sit down and talk about the 14 stops of dynamic range. I want to show you that. So I think it helps to have both kinds of people, people who will give you the nerdy, but then people who will also show you what it's actually like to use the camera. So I think both sides of it have, a, have an equally important side. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I totally get what you mean. Like, you know, you could, I could, I could say here, this, this battery is the best battery for the FX, for the FX3 or whatever. Why? Like I want to show you, you know what I mean? Right. It's kind of like it's kind of like when you wrote a paper in high school, and you have to write your thesis as to why you're like, you know, this is my this is my point, and this is why. Like that's the kind of concept I put. I'm making a YouTube video as to why you should own this, not just saying you should own it, right? Like I'm not. I I also understand like there's a community building aspect to this, and so like I don't want to just shove a product in front of someone's face that I that they I've earned their trust through my videos, and then I'm giving you something just telling you to buy. It. I don't want to do that, right? I want to tell you. I've used this or I would recommend this because that's kind of my, like my methodology behind the videos I make on the YouTube channel and TikTok. Right. Um, going back to the sports uh, videography uh, with NHL, uh, during the off season, do you like, do you do other sports out there or what do you exactly do you do as far as like to keep yourself busy? Yeah, I mean, I'm still working. It's a full-time job. So, you know, we have the off season. I'm, we're in it right now. We're in the last little bit of August. Um, you know, I'm still working full-time nine to five and so my schedule kind of flips during the season. When I'm not traveling, I'm working out of the office here in Toronto and I'm working from like six to two in the morning when the games are going on uh, from like the start of our East Coast games to the end of our West Coast games. Uh, in the summer, it flips around. I'm working nine to five hours in the office and, you know, we had a remote day, which is really nice. So most of my days are filled up where, you know, uh, a lot of it is, you know, just re kind of getting our feet to get like getting everything together after the crazy seven or eight months that we just went, you know, archiving stuff, organizing things, making sure we're clean and prepped and, you know, organized as much and that as that takes can. a lot of time. File and organization. It, oh, I, I spent like the whole like of July, like archiving of transcoding projects. Like, and, and you know, it's important to do because one day down the line, we might want, oh, what about this video we make? Can we reuse it? Go back, pull it. We have the files. It's important. I hate doing it. <laughs> if my boss is listening to this, like I'm going to do it because it's my job, but it's so tedious. But we we do a lot of that. We do, um, you know, prep for the next season. We're brainstorming a lot of stuff, planning ahead. Like we're already starting to plan ahead the major events because before we know it, it's going to be New Year's and the Winter Classic is going to be here and like the start of season. We're going to have to start editing stuff in the next two months because the season starts like middle of October. So a lot of pre prep stuff like that. I'm, I'm going to be going away in the next week for uh, to Halifax out east to cover an, an NHL camp because players are starting to train now, too. So it's kind of like, you know, I'm still working there. I do have a lot more time on the side. Uh, it's nice having my weeknights because it means I can have a social life, but it also means I can take other shoots and I can do other things. I shoot weddings as well. Uh, it mostly, oh, I didn't season. know that. Yeah, I shoot. So like I have a side, side hustle, side hustle. It's a side business. <laughs> it's not a hustle. I, it's a good, it's, a, it's obviously what making wedding films. Uh, me and my good friend, Kyle Bohem, we, uh, he works in fashion. So completely the other side of, of the, the, like the wheel of me being sports, but me and him like work really well doing weddings. We like the, I like the storytelling there. Um, and so we, we do that in the off season. I'm shooting one this weekend. I shot a couple this summer. I only really try to do like two or three because it, it, weddings are so much work and it gets to be a lot. But uh, me and Kyle work really well together. We enjoy doing it. Like I love the storytelling behind a, a, a wedding. Uh, it's very similar to sports. I People were like, why don't you shoot sports and you shoot weddings? Like, how does that make sense? I'm like, look, when you really boil it down to the necessities, you have one moment you need to capture in each. It's like the game winning shot and the kiss. Like it's the same thing. And frankly, like I might, sh I'm going to get to shoot a couple's first kiss once I'm going to get to shoot like a hundred different baskets or goals or whatever. So it's, it's like very similar. Yeah. Storytelling. And, it, and, it, and it also helps you sharper your blade as well. Yeah. And it's a different form of like art, like artistic expression. Like I get to edit something different. I get to create something different. I get to do something completely different. Uh, I've been doing weddings. I've been working with uh, a friend of mine and some UFC athletes here in, here in Canada and Ontario this summer. Uh, so just branching out, I, I occasionally shoot football for the CFL here. I, I used to work with the Argos and I have connections around the league. So, you know, occasionally shoot some football. Uh, I'm still pretty close in the basketball community here in Toronto. So I've shot a few basketball events in the city. Um, so I, I take the summer to obviously keep working at my job, but taking other opportunities. And, you know, I 
I love shooting hockey, but it was nice to shoot basketball. It was really cool to shoot a UFC athlete for a bit. It's it's nice to get time because in the regular season, there's no fucking way I'm going to get to do that. There's like yeah. zero chance. Yeah, I, I love hearing that you actually branch out into different avenues in the filmmaking space, not just in one specific. Because uh, I feel like uh, I, I don't want young creators to just think like, all right, you need to stick to one niche and the one niche only and never do anything else. Like you got to focus on this one. Like I love how you just said like, because I, I myself do. I also do wedding filmmaking, but I never really promote or anything like that. But it's just like we're yeah. kind of thing, you know. Um, so I really appreciate someone like you that could actually are not shy to like do some other grunt work as well. Yeah, I think it's important to do it, too, because you learn so many different things like in wedding filmmaking alone. Like you have to you're kind of the same concept. You're a one man band or, or two guys with my, in our case. Um, and we have to you have to learn how to do audio on the fly. You have to learn how to, you know, all that stuff. And but that comes in handy down the line. I've used the things interchangeably um, it, and not just weddings. Like I I help out my friends hire me on for corporate shoots to help them out or, or other stuff. Like it's important to there's nothing wrong with niching down, especially if you really love the niche you're in. But it's important to make sure, especially if you're freelancing, that you're finding other avenues, not just of making money, but of learning and sharpening your skill set. I learned so much when I'm working with other people especially on other things like music videos. I hate music videos. I'll never ever shoot a music video. It's I I I don't like I I shoot so much run and gun stuff in sports that when it comes to doing something methodically by scene by scene by scene shot by shot, I hate that. But I learned so much anytime I'm on set helping some of my friends or other colleagues on a music video. You learn different things about gear, you learn composition, you learn things in such a different light. And then you take that and apply it to sports. Like one thing I've learned just with documentary and wedding work alone is like the importance of composition in a shot. And if I go back to, you know, the start of my sports career or not even the start, like let's go back two years. And then I started doing weddings and a few other things to now the way I compose my shots, the way my footage visibly looks when I'm shooting sports is entirely different. Because you just pick up little things in other niches and other genres of content creating that you can then apply in your work. It, it helps you build in your main niche as well to try different things. And you never know who you're going to meet in these in these moments. And sometimes your worlds cross. I shot a wedding in December for one of Canada's national women's players. Like she plays on the senior women's team. Like I shot her wedding and it was that was the word of mouth. But like sometimes it just crosses up in between. You know right. what I mean? As we're wrapping up, man, um, do you have any advice like top three advices if you want um, to for any aspiring videographers that's trying to break into the, the sports videography industry with limited gear or even resources and uh, connections. I asked this at the end of my podcast, but you just made it so much harder by giving me those limitations. So <laughs> limited access to gear. And what was the other one? And uh, and connections. Because um, I mean, connections is everything. And yeah. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, if you're, if I think everyone starts in that situation though, you know, you don't, you don't have a lot of money. You don't have a lot of gear. You might have spent your savings on one camera. Um, I mean, the number one thing is just like go in, go and fucking shoot. Like it's, it's again, it's easy for me to say that, but like if you need to find something you want to start with, if you want to shoot sports, go and shoot your local soccer teams, basketball teams, hockey teams, cricket i don't care just go and shoot it and make stuff out of it like build a body of work because if you go to if then once you have those connections i always say that like you can you can be the most talented person in the room but if you don't have anyone to give your work to it's useless so it's important to like have work under your belt even if it's like the smallest thing like you shot your little cousin's softball game or whatever just by shooting that you have something that then you can show to someone maybe someone who was at the game or someone that you know whose son also plays like baseball or whatever and they want you to shoot their game then you have an example be like this is what I did here let me do it for you so having that body of work at the start is like the biggest thing is like understand that just by getting those reps in you're helping yourself even if you're not getting paid too you're not going to get paid all the time the second thing i would say is like don't be discouraged um, whether it's in sports or just general content creation, doesn't matter what niche you're in. The one thing I, I really stress to people all the time is like, don't be discouraged. If you got said, you got to no. know you're going to get a lot of no's. You're going to get a lot of no's because they don't need your service because you're too expensive because they already have someone or they just don't, don't want it. Don't let that discourage you because we live in a time now where, um, our skill set is so desired. Uh, like, I heard this once on, my, on another podcast, like we're in the creator boom, you know, like everyone needs content, everybody, shops, coffee shops, you know, uh, individuals, mom, brands, individuals, like brands, <laughs> like teams, everyone needs content. People who are photographers, videographers, 
copywriters, whatever you are, you're so needed right now. So for as many no's as you're going to get, you'll find a few yeses there. And as you get those yeses, those will accumulate more work. And then you get back into that cycle, the, the content piece. If you feed it, it'll feed you back. You make content, that'll get you hired. So as don't get discouraged, especially at the start when you got a lot of no's. And even down the line, like I've been rejected for jobs like more than I've gotten yeses before I got to the NHL job. Like I said, there's some things that you guys, people don't see on social media. I had two other pro sports teams. I went through full interviews with them and then they just didn't hire me. They, one of them didn't even get back to me. I just got no, I got ghosted. Right. So you don't be discouraged, like keep at it, especially if you want to do it. Like this line of work is incredibly valuable and needed at this time. The last third piece of advice I would give is like, enjoy the ride because this is something I have definitely learned in the last few years. It's like sometimes you got to sit back and take in where you are, especially down the line when you're at cool places. Like understand that you get to do something that you love for your career. You get to earn a living out of it. You get to form your life around it. And that's really cool. And I don't think even nowadays, a lot of people get to say that. Like a lot of people think you got to go to college and get, become a doctor or a lawyer or a biz, or banker or whatever. And you sit in the office and do a nine to five. You don't get you don't have to do that. And you, you are, you get to do what you love and that's incredible. And it's like, the third thing is, like I said, just sit back and enjoy the ride. Enjoy the fact you get to do this for a living. One thing I do every time at a major event is I will literally put my camera down for like five seconds, look around and I'm like, wow, I get to do that. You know what I mean? So just appreciate what you get to do because at some point, one point in your life, whether it's through age or whatever, like you're going to stop and you're going to be like, shit, I wish I took that moment in more or appreciated the, the thing I was doing more. You, you know, to people listening to like into this podcast and working in the content, like you get to do something that no one else gets to do. You need to get to tell stories. You get to create content, help people build their brands. And that's a really cool thing to do. And you kind of, most people get to do it on their own hours. And that's really cool. So like appreciate that, appreciate the whole thing that you do and understand that like you're very lucky to be doing it. I love that, man. That was, that was, that was great, man. Yeah, because I try to, Every time I'm shooting something like I if I'm working with somebody and I I'll, I'll like stop and like tap on my yo, bro, like we get paid doing this, man. Like, can you believe yeah. this? And there's like, <laughs> I know, man, like it's crazy that we're holding a camera getting paid for this. It's like to me, it's like the best thing, man. It's like such a blessing, um, especially yeah. now. Like it's only going to get more and more available for like everyone to like get into the space. Like I encourage people to pick up a camera. If you're if you've been thinking about doing it, just do it, man. Like nothing. I mean, what's the worst that could happen? You can like, even just, use your phone like these. Like I know I know people are going to be like, eh, it's not a camera. Like there are people who make a living off fucking TikTok making content on this thing like this. These cameras are great. Like I know, if, yeah, I know, I know a few individuals that literally specifically create content for their clients and they're making six figures like a year just with their iPhone. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. You don't need the fancy camera. Like you can just take your phone and do something with it and then use that as proof of concept. Like it is, it is that easy. Like you said, it's so much more accessible. So it's like, if you want to get into it, like dive right in. Yeah. And now is like the perfect time to get into it right now. Uh, well, Juan, man, it's been amazing. Uh, thank you for being on this podcast, man. If you guys really want to connect with Juan, uh, his Instagram and his YouTube channel will also be linked in the description. I highly encourage you guys to check out his YouTube channel. If you're looking into getting into the, into the sports videography space, he, he breaks it down, like on how he shoots certain things and like how he approaches each shoot, like what lenses, what cameras and all that good stuff. So I really highly recommend checking out his channel. And he also has a podcast too, man. We're going to bring that back up, man. I'm uh, sorry. Are you going to bring that podcast back up? It's been a while since you uploaded. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, yeah, I have. Man. A, no, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's tough because like I balance that in YouTube and work. So like my whole thing is like, I try to do like two YouTube videos, a podcast episode, two YouTube videos, but it's tough to work. I just recorded one. Um, it, it really is just another avenue for me to content, like talk yeah. with other creators. So uh, it's called the sports creative showcase. I, I hopefully will have an episode up in the next little while. It's just kind of that weird part in the summer where like I have a few weddings on the back. I'm going to go edit a wedding film as soon as we get off this. <laughs> I have that on the back. Log, I've worked, I'm leaving. Like it's so many different things. So um, but yeah, no, it'll it'll be coming back it'll slowly but surely, you know. Uh, I understand, man. I'm just giving you some slack right now. But like uh <laughs> but Juan, dude, thank you so much for joining the podcast, guys, and uh we'll see you guys soon. All right, peace.